The Death Wish Under the Full Moon Western Fiction Tale by Daniel Belay Narrated by Natural Reader Tip Top, a silver mining community in Yavapai County of Arizona Territory, was founded around 1875. Discoveries of rich silver in this deep desert canyon had set miners agog. Within two years Tip Top with 1,200 rushers was Central Arizona's largest mining camp and a place of busy enterprise. This productive canyon also became a suitably sized town, which further included six saloons, brothels, a post office, a jail, and courthouse. It also ran a stage line to Prescott. Although many of Tip Top's early miners were veterans of the Civil War, both Union and Confederate, they were essentially compatible. However, other miners of rougher nature had drifted in during those recent years. One in particular in 1886 was William Alex Spencer. This brief history is based on his scenario, a young, impetuous and aggressive hoodlum whose devilish lifestyle, generated by drinking heavily, which he adopted from his father, led him eventually into the path to his own destruction at such an early age. William Alex Spencer, best known as Billy, was a tall slender fellow in his early twenties with bushy brown hair. He had slightly dark tan skin from his mother's side of her Spanish nationality. His late mother had died many years ago of a long sickness. After her death his father, a Caucasian fellow that was born French by nationality, turned to drinking while raising Billy and nearly abused him when he was in that state of drunkenness. He finally took his son and had moved to Tip Top to make a living of working in the mines, which his son eventually came of age had joined him in the working class. However, in recent years Billy lost his father. His father caused himself to get very drunk one night at one of the saloons and killed a fellow miner over a card game. He refused to be arrested and the sheriff was forced to shoot him dead in a exchange gunplay. Despite the loss of his parents Billy Spencer had stayed in the community and continued working in the mines. Whiskey drinking and poker games in Ed Wager's saloon at Tip Top became the mining camp's favorite pastime. Common card games helped miners relax after long hard 8 to 10 hours shifts. But the accompanying whiskey often led to high tensions, ugly words, pushing and shoving, and flying fists. However, saloon homicides were reasonably uncommon, but they do occur. This brief overall history is based upon one specific incident at Ed Wager's saloon which had furthered followed out in the street. This is the story of, Billy Alex Spencer. Story opens in the late hours of the night in the desert canyon town of Tip Top. It was a full moon which indeed has lit up the main street. From the Ed Wager saloon one liquored up Billy Spencer is carried out through the slinging doors by two furious fellow miners. From there they thrown him into the street. The force of the toss had caused Billy to roll rapid and hard along the dirt for a good distance. The two miners continue to follow out from the saloon to bring further afflictions upon the troublemaking drunkard. His two adversaries were fairly drunk themselves. One of them was about 34, a blonde hair slender fellow named, James Jackson, better known as JJ, and the other was a younger fellow about 22, a stronger build, bushy brown hair, named Austin Peters. Both boys were very rough nature. Billy Spencer forced himself up to prepare to face the angry opponents and quickly drew his gun upon them. James Jackson was quick to kick the pistol out of Billy's hand as Austin Peters made his first punch into Billy's face. Each cowboys took their turns giving impact of their fists into Billy Spencer's face and stomach until such time where Billy was able to return a few good punches back at each of them. Billy Spencer wrestled hard with the two cowboys to the point that they ripped his shirt apart, but Billy had gotten fairly lucky in one instant and has given James a solid punch into his face which had landed James Jackson into the dirt nearly unconscious. However Austin Peters was much stronger built and it was harder for Billy to take him on. James regained his senses quickly and found Billy's pistol in the dirt. He had picked it up and approached from behind Billy who was forcing himself up to take on Austin. Quickly, with the butt of the gun, James slammed it hard against the side of Billy's head. Billy Spencer collapsed downward into the dirt to unconsciousness. The two boys kicked the troublemaker drunkard several times to make sure he was out. Billy's face appeared bloody, which included running blood down the side of his face from the butt of the gun that had hit him. The town sheriff just happened to show up at about that time when James took some money from Billy's vest. Sheriff Daniel O'Reilly asked the two young rough fellows what was going on. JJ responded, Sorry Sheriff, what had happened is that no good drunken scumbag bumped into me at the standing bar and spilled my drink on my partner. 
I asked him to pay for another drink and he got all barbaric and full of profanity where he next started pushing me and my partner and then the fists were flying. I had managed at some point to hold the cocky bastard while Austin gave him a few short round with his fists, enough to punch him hard enough to send him into the floor to nearly unconsciousness. After that we had picked him up and carried him to the slinging doors then tossed the drunk out into the street. We had come out to further deal with the drunkard and he pulled a gun on us. Lucky, I had kicked it out of his hand in time and we went a few rounds with him until I knocked him out cold with his own gun. That is when you saw me taking some money from him that he owed me for the drink he spilled out of my hand. Sheriff O'Reilly moved toward the comatose body and bent down in front of it. With his hand he grabbed hold a few of the fellow's brown hair to lift enough of the head in order to give a good look at his face. Then the sheriff turned to the boys and replied, I just don't know about this boys, you are a pair of ruffins and quite drunk as well of what I see. I am sure you have more you two haven't told me and I am certain you fellows has added just as much trouble in the incident. However, I do know this young fellow. Billy Spencer here has long reputation as a troublemaker, not to mention the hard drinking he has adopted from his abused father. I am not surprised if he had started the trouble. I'm not saying you two boys are off the hook. The sheriff went on to say, all right then, I want you two boys to lift this hoodlum up and drag his comatose body to the bench against the building in a sit-up position. The two local miners did as they were told. James Jackson and Austin lifted up Billy's body and they took him by the shoulders and dragged the unconscious fellow towards the boardwalk where they sat him down on the bench with his back against the building of the sheriff's office. Next the sheriff asked the boys to go to the water well down the street and fill a bucket with water and bring it back to him. James and Austin came back with the full bucket. Sheriff Daniel O'Reilly asked the boys to set the bucket down near the bench and then said, Now boys, I think you two had enough to drink tonight. I am going to give you a choice, you two can go to jail, or you boys can get on your horse and ride back to your quarters. JJ replied, But we have friends inside the saloon. Sheriff O'Reilly responded, your co-workers can stay as long as they behave themselves, you two get on your horses and ride out. Austin Peters replied, Curiosity, what is going to happen to Billy Spencer? Is he going to jail? The sheriff responded, That is none of your concern, you just ride out of here and I will deal with him next. James Jackson and Austin Peters decided best not to further their situation by provoking the sheriff. The two miners got on their horses and rode back to their living quarters. Sheriff Daniel O'Reilly waited until the boys were far enough out of sight and then he lifted the bucket of water and splashed it upon Billy Spencer's face. It took two soaking to wake up the young fellow. The sheriff next grabbed the groggy Billy by the arm and neck and forced Billy up from the bench and tossed him hard into the street. Sheriff Daniel O'Reilly figured that the young man had enough painful punished from the two boys that he could just send him home. However, Billy Spencer figured things different. The young hoodlum began shaking off his grogginess, while lifting himself up from the street. Sheriff O'Reilly shouted at him. Can't let you get into conflicts and demolish the place because you can't hold your liquor boy. I want you on your horse and out of here. Billy stumbled along the ground where he found his pistol lying in the dirt. He reached for the iron and had holstered it, then he looked up at the sheriff in an anger manner and said. Nobody, but nobody throws me out of anywhere Mr. Lawman and gets away with it. That two son of bitches in there had caused me much trouble, I am planning to go back in there and finish the job if it means shooting them bastards dead. The sheriff responded quick, no you not Billy Spencer, besides, you won't find them in the saloon, I chased them boys out and sent them home. You're drunk Billy, your shirt is ripped to pieces, you are bleeding from the side of your face from the butt of the gun you were hit by. Now you need to go home and sleep this off. Like I said, get on you horse and ride out of here before I change my mind and throw you in jail. The sheriff started to turn to head back into the sheriff's office when Billy suddenly shouted out, why you turn your back on me Sheriff O'Reilly, I not done talking to you yet. Sheriff O'Reilly turned and said, what do you want boy, jail time. Billy replied, you shot and killed my pot about two years ago you murdering bastard. Sheriff responded, so that is what this is about. I am sorry about that son but your pa gave me no choice. He was drunk and shot a man in the saloon after accusing him of car cheating and then tried to resist arrest when he came rushing out with his gun blazing. Besides, why do you care about him, he was always drunk and had abused you. You had always hated him, what has make you change your feeling now? Billy responded, so what, 
he was not always like that in the beginning when my mother was still alive. Yes, I hated him after he turned to drinking, yet, he was still my old man and you had killed him. Now it is my turn, let's see if you have the guts enough to prove to me how swift you are of taking me sheriff, especially a man behind the reputation of a badge and gun, or, perhaps you are just a stinky coward hiding behind a tin star. Billy spit into the ground. Sheriff replied. You don't want to draw on me Billy, especially being so drunk. You going to end up dead like your pa. Is this what you really want? I going to give you two options kid. One, you can get on your horse, go home, and sleep this off. Or two, you can stay here where I will force to drop you and you can reside in a more permanent dwelling of a pine box, is this what you want boy? Billy responded, fine lawman as I prefer to go with option two, except it will be you I will plant in Boot Hill. The sheriff replied, are you that stupid kid? You know if you go home and sleep this off you may feel different about this whole thing in the morning. Billy Spencer shouted out loud, damn you sheriff, draw your gun. Sheriff Daniel O'Reilly spoke firmly, you are just like your old man, go right ahead kid, you make the first move. The sheriff could tell Billy Spencer quickly transform into uneasiness as his right hand started shivering upon his gun holster. Then suddenly Billy pulled his hand away from his gun and began backing away. Sheriff O'Reilly perceived that Billy may have come to his senses and said, go home Billy, please, go home. The sheriff began to turn to walk away but he immediately sensed that Billy Spencer was about to take that open window advantage to unfairly draw on the lawman from behind. Sheriff Daniel O'Reilly wasted no time and in a heartbeat he had whirl around with the gun already out of his holstered and instantly fired it. The bullet burst solid into Billy's left chest above the heart and had exited out his back, spraying a large amount of blood out from both wounds. This happened just seconds before Billy's gun fired. It has caused his bullet to go off course as Billy Spencer spun around in much pain and then sending him crashing into the dirt. Sheriff O'Reilly next watched as Billy crawled forward through the dirt, leaving dispersing blood trail along the way. His right arm was straight forward, reaching for his gun lying where he dropped it and showing his other hand covering his bleeding wound. The sheriff shouted out, don't do it Billy, don't go for that gun. Billy Spencer forcefully grabbed his gun and began to thrust himself upwards. He was coughing and spitting blood out of his mouth as he tried to blaring out words, you, dirty, stinking, bastard. Billy was about halfway up with his gun pointed at the lawman when Sheriff O'Reilly quickly fired four more rounds in Billy's direction. Three out of four bullets had successfully reached its target. The first one impacted into Billy Spencer's lower ribs. The second slug struck roughly four inches left side of his other wound in the lower ribs. The last bullet struck him in the right chest about seven inches from his heart. The impact of those bullets caused Billy to jerk and twist violently as blood squirted out in every direction. He instantly collapsed and landed face down into the dirt. Sheriff Daniel O'Reilly quickly reloaded his revolver with just couple bullets and then had his weapon pointed in the direction of where Billy Spencer lay. From there he cautioned himself towards him. At about this same time a few saloon patrons that heard the shooting had rushed out the slinging doors to survey the incident. They saw the sheriff approaching the bloody body lying in the street. The first thing the sheriff did is kick the gun away from the body and next shoved Billy over on his back with his boot. Then he got himself down to inspect his condition. Billy Spencer was barely hanging on. Sheriff O'Reilly bent over and whisper into Billy's ear, I have warned you Billy, I gave you all the chances to live and now it is a shame that we have to bury you now. Sheriff analyzed and saw that Billy full body was quivering violently. He watched the dying young man trying to gag for air as his lungs were damaged to long hope. He was gargling blood from his lips. Then finally Billy took his last breath of air where he next coughed up a large chunk of blood, then it happened, his eyes gone wide and into a fixed stare, exhibiting proof that he was now dead. The sheriff took his hand and gently closed Billy's eyes. Next he checked the dead man's pockets for any money he may have to pay for his burial. There was not much Billy had on him but perhaps enough money for a cheap burial without the use of a casket. Sheriff O'Reilly next got himself back up and turned toward the onlookers near the saloon and said, somebody wake up the undertaker and tell him there is a fresh body out here. The bloody corpse of William Alex Spencer had laid in the moonlight street for nearly an hour before it was brought to the undertaker parlor. 
The remains was buried the next day in a cheap grave next to Billy's father's grave site in the town cemetery above the hill. The End Western Fiction Tale by Daniel Belay Narrated by Natural Reader <laughs>